Hello, we invite you to join uh, and listen to the panels uh, under the common title Cities and Spaces of Urban Life Beyond COVID-19. Uh, they are organized uh, by the Future of Places Center from Kateha and the Oris House of Architecture uh, and are an integral part uh, of the Days of Oris, October 2021. Um, the COVID crisis acted as a catalyst uh, of awareness towards burning issues we have been slow to recognize and act upon in the past decades, such as the battle of climate change, the battle of sick and divided uh, cities facing constant expansion, but also the creeping, increasingly hybridized environments uh, that have uh, become realized to their full extent uh, during lockdown. Um, and. Uh, Inaction was perhaps not only due to, as Slava Zizek uh, put it almost a decade ago, the fact that we don't have a clear understanding of the main issues, but also due to the fact that tackling them would require uh, a massive radical change that acting upon them can hardly be imagined in the full scope needed. Um, however, in an interview with Bruno Latour, which was published soon after uh, lockdown started, he pointed to the lesson um, that we indeed can quickly and radically change the way uh, that we operate and we can use this lesson to rethink the desire to go back to business as usual uh, and align our modes of action to fighting climate change. Our capacity to adapt, uh, but also the capacity of nature to regenerate as we witnessed uh, in the beginning when everything came to a halt. Uh, was indeed a reassuring notion that perhaps change is possible. Uh, as Latour put it, uh, we should not miss the chance of doing something else. Lockdown also has pointed in the direction of changes in micro, metro and macro scale. Our places of living have become places of work uh, and the return to the office is greatly reconsidered now. Uh, it will happen but in a redefined uh, manner as it has been clearly shown that the space of work um, is often just a framing of many other things than the work itself uh, which can often be done from anywhere uh, but the collaboration and the interaction energies uh, that uh, quite obviously cannot be replaced uh, by uh, the zoom screen are our reason for uh, going back. Furthermore, uh, interactions stemming from trade or consuming culture uh, have long uh, have already a tendency uh, towards platformization, but the impact that this has had during the pandemic, uh, when it was the only mode of it interaction, has yet to be shown. And finally, uh, the platformization of public space, uh, as was the topic of inquiry of uh, Strelka's current technology uh, research project, which also looked into the massive changes pandemics have had on cities in general throughout human history, um, is uh, another important notion to be discussed. So four talks, uh, actually three panels and a dialogue, uh, will dive into these issues uh, under the common title Cities and Spaces of Urban Life Beyond COVID-19. And from many different perspectives, uh, they will look at these issues and their various scales of manifestation, exploring how automation and digitalization have changed us, how much our society uh, care about the common good, how the changes of working uh, and living environments have changed, uh, and whether the move towards smart cities will in fact make them smart or perhaps not so much. Uh, and whether we really have the capacity to act upon mitigating uh, climate change and the burning issues we're facing. So we welcome you to join us. These panels will be moderated by Maro Emrdulas, by Srećko Horvat, Tigran Haas, with a final discussion between Tigran Haas and Saskia Sassen. Uh, we invite you to join us. I'm very excited and honored uh, to chair and open this uh, discussion uh, at the festival Days of Oris, uh, co-organized uh, with the Center for the Future of Places, uh, on the relationship between, on the one hand, spatiality, uh, space, uh, whether it is cities or living in nature, and on the other side, uh, the catastrophe. 
uh, the extinction, if you want, but also the rapid technological changes uh, which are happening either due to natural catastrophes uh, uh, or to, well, human-made catastrophes. So uh, what we will discuss today uh, is uh, these topics, uh, and they will be discussed uh, by, by our guests tonight, uh, uh, which is uh, Boris Budan, uh, who is joining us uh, from Berlin, uh, Renata Villa, uh, who is joining us uh, from Paris at this moment, and Franco Berardo Bifo, who is joining us from Bologna. Um, all of them have been dealing in one way or the other, whether it's philosophical or from the point of view of technology or point of view from psychoanalysis, uh, in a way with space and its relation to society. Uh, so uh, let me pose the first question to, to Boris Budan. Uh, uh, you have been not only a translator of Sigmund Freud uh, uh, to, to our language, uh, but you have been dealing uh, precisely with this notion of the apocalypse uh, in the sense of uh, sub sublimation on the one hand, and in the sense of this kind of fascination with the world without people. You have been lecturing, writing precisely on this uh, documentary where you have you know, the world which is completely empty of people, just buildings, just empathy, infrastructure. And I want to pose you this question also, you know, how do you see it today after two years of the pandemic? Uh, you have been moving from Berlin to, to, to Vienna, to Zagreb. So you have been visiting spaces which had one or the other version of a lockdown of cities being completely empty. Uh, but you have also been uh, witnessing uh, the earthquakes in Zagreb and other parts of Croatia. So. Uh, what is this special relation between space and catastrophe? Uh, do we still can achieve some sort of, you know, this Kantian sublimation that the catastrophe can give us a kind of, uh, 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 you know, uh, view into how society works? And what did we learn after two years of the pandemic? Uh, thank you. Thank you for inviting me and thank you for this uh, interesting question. Yes, it did. I, I was fascinated by this documentary, uh, the, the world after people. And what is interesting, the, to the real topic of the, the, the documentary is the decay. You know, after the last human disappears from the world, there is still sort of camera, cameras goes uh, go on and 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 depict the world after the people. You know what happens to Chapel six, uh, uh, Sixtina uh, after people are you know gone, and then it slowly crumbles, disappears. My question was for whom? Who, whose gaze is this after the people have disappeared from the world? And my answer, the only possible way, uh, answer, was this is not a dystopian picture. This is a utopian picture of a knowledge society in which uh, the idea of knowledge has become, you know, so powerful that, that people think that it even might survive the humans so that humans will disappear, but knowledge will know what happens after them. So this is, this is a one thing... Um, uh, you ask about catastrophe, it seems in the knowledge society, utopia is that knowledge can survive any sort of catastrophe. You know, the earth uh, uh, is burned down by the climate, by the global warming, but this is, this is still, we, uh, the, the knowledge knows, not with knowledge without people, of course. Uh, this is one thing. And another thing, asking about, about catastrophe, I was thinking, you know, we are talk, talking about this post-pandemic pandemic spaces, and I ask myself whether it is pandemia that has brought about a transformation, generated some new transformation. And uh, what I have found is actually, actually, actually a negative answer. I mean, I think that pandemia has not created its own, its own space, that pandemia is not sort of uh, original catastrophe, but it opens the, the existing wounds. You know, it is the moment of truth. It exposes an ongoing catastrophe. So I would, uh, you know, uh, when we look into the, into the pandemia, into the disease, uh, we see only one major problem, and this is how society or what has been left 
of former society. I might, I might use the, the notion of former society, which would be probably the best way, you know, how it, it reacts. And I must say that original catastrophe is the catastrophe of neoliberal destruction of, of society. And pandemia is simply opening our eyes for this ongoing catastrophe. This is uh, brilliant and it brings me directly to Renata Villa, uh, who has been dealing with these topics uh, uh, for, I would say, a decade at least, uh, uh, framing it uh, in the context of uh, what she calls digital colonialism. Uh, you, Boris, mentioned uh, how this myth of knowledge society even survives uh, you know, the complete dissolution of society. Uh, we could even think of radioactivity and how long it remains and, we you know, who will be able to understand it at 10,000 years. Or we could think about the, you know, the, the, what we sent to space, the music from Earth, believing that there will be someone uh, who, will, who will, you know, read it and know how to understand it. Uh, so, Renata, my question is, uh, how do you see this? Um, how did the pandemic, first pandemic, but then uh, there are, of course, other aspects and of course there is the climate crisis which, which is affecting uh, uh, space and speciality uh, how did the pandemic actually affect uh, uh, had an effect on the acceleration of what you call digital colonialism uh, like for instance we could talk about uh, how big big tech silicon valley is taking over cities uh, you know trying to smuggle this idea of smart cities uh, 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 we could also look at how big tech, for instance, Palantir is penetrating into the healthcare infrastructure. Uh, so how did this revelation uh, uh, of, the, of, of the COVID crisis actually, uh, did it serve? And in which ways, maybe you can also give some concrete examples, did it serve this even deeper colonialism of big tech uh, uh, from Silicon Valley into, into Europe, since we speak about Europe these days? Yes, uh, well, I will not only touch, touch Europe, uh, because I think that it's also important to have a, a bigger picture of this, but how it, you know, it destroyed years and years of work, basically, years of work of making people aware of uh, the risks and the level of, uh, level of uh, penetration of technologies in society. Why? Because it suddenly became really useful for uh, people to understand what was going on. For example, concre concrete example, Google had better information on movements of people and reduction of movements between place to place than any government in the world. Uh, monitoring the pandemic, monitoring the numbers, delivering real time information to people. It, it was out of control of even armies, you know, like uh, uh, the, the uh, big tech uh, found the moment, you know, found the moment to make the case for a surveillance society. Because surveillance was always like in the last 10 years, thanks to Julian Assange and Snowden, it was something that was uh, connected to harassment of activism, or, you know, groups, uh, dissident groups, something bad, okay, for terrorism, but using excess and something that shouldn't be like the default. And the pandemic made a very strong case for it to be like the default and to be good to protect you. So uh, it was a boom in cells basically uh, of, uh, sell, of sell, selling empty promises of controlling the pandemic. But what it revealed also is that even, even the most sophisticated surveillance systems didn't detect the human, didn't detect the things that we need identified. And it was actually resilient networks of people, the, the, better, the, you know, the better managers of the, of the pandemic. But, uh, um, but it really, uh, countries that were hesitating to adopt uh, invasive technologies or even, you know, uh, institutions that were like hesitating to share data massively, you know, a state of emergency opened doors to share everything, including in Europe, including GDPR didn't stop it, you know, and, and um, big business for the U.S. basically, uh, they, they, they are like U.S. companies are the big winners of this, consolidating the power over Europe. It was the Europe takeover. It was not necessarily uh, Chinese or from or even European uh, technical solutions, the ones implemented. The governments, even in these very rich countries, were completely in, uh, unable to execute. Uh, and that, that's one aspect. The other aspect is it, it made uh, it open up uh, new inequalities that were invisible to us. 
the right to education now is tied to the to the to buying devices one for each child in the household and to be connected to like you know like uh, in in and that, that case touches me particularly bad because in Guatemala and in many countries it is not it's not exclusive of of the develop, developing world um, is the idea of distributed home and for many children all over the world going to school is their safe home you know is their safe place is a place where they have the only meal that they they can receive in the day and it's a clean space of learning you know uh, uh, without uh, if you live in a very humble home you cannot study you cannot learn you know you cannot interact so school is a is a is a, is a community that uh, that where, where a child feels safe especially vulnerable ch- children during the pandemic you can imagine a, a very very uh, uh, small house with three people trying to work from it with very precarious connectivity and, and limited, like, you know, how technology has, some say that had enabled, but I say had limited the right to work, the right to education, and the right to a decent, decent environment for, uh, for that to happen for many, many people all, all over the world. So I would say that, uh, it, okay, we, we read uh, the very bourgeois stories, oh, my nomad life, lifestyle was interrupted, I couldn't go to work at the cafe. But if we look deeper in society, you know, like having access to machines and having a constant access, being connected constantly was the only way to keep functioning in this. And the states were not prepared uh, to provide that infrastructure and nobody was responding for, for, for these people. There was very, very few examples of solidarity of the neighbor opening the Wi-Fi so the, the other person could uh, also connect because all the design of technology is highly individualistic. We design technology just to be used one in one and connectivity too, you know, like at the beginning, Wi-Fi was more distributed. Now you see the ridiculous thing in any building or see all the connections instead of a communal vision of being, of, of connected and collaborate in, in a more open environment. So uh, that I will say like yeah, just to start, not to monopolize the conversation. Number one, uh, uh, this takeover, uh, a big, pro- huge profit like never before and complete takeover consolidation of uh, digital colonialism of Europe. Uh, I, I mean, I, it is very interesting to see a Western country being colonized so fast without resistance. And second, uh, the complete takeover of, of the education system and, and how it is affecting the many. Yeah, I think that's, uh, that's a very impo- important point you made uh, uh, because you, it shows how different aspects of human life or human activity are being affected by uh, this rapid technological change. And I think education is definitely one of the most important ones uh, when you have so many children now uh, being forced uh, to follow, you know, lectures online and uh, also intellectuals, academics doing everything online or in a hybrid way. Uh, the other field is, of course, healthcare as well, which is being uh, completely colonized by technology, uh, transport as well, but also housing, if you want. So, so, so many, many different things, uh, which brings me to, to, to our next participant, uh, Franco Berardi Bifo, uh, who has written uh, uh, a lot uh, exactly on these topics. Uh, in one of your books, uh, uh, you have uh, coined the term of cognitive mutation, that technology is actually leading us in a direction of a one-way street. You know, we, there is no going back anymore. And what we are witnessing now, as Boris and Renata have described, is that this mutation is happening uh, not just anymore when you go outside to the city and then you are, you know, being controlled by different sorts of technology, whether it is surveillance or automated systems of traffic, but it is now coming into our homes. So it is also coming directly into our brains in a way, uh, especially if you read about the Silicon Valley dreams of uh, Neuralink, for instance, by Elon Musk, uh, or now Facebook changing the name into Meta, uh, trying to create a metaverse where people would actually live in a sort of virtual reality uh, and, uh, uh, and so on. Uh, so how does it look like uh, to you who have been dealing with this for decades? Uh, uh, did we reach a, a threshold where there is no return back? And can these technologies still be hacked 
used uh, for creating a more, as Renata would say, communal space, a space of the commons, a space of care, an infrastructure of care? Um, <clears throat> first, I want to, uh, um, to emphasize what Boris, Boris said. Uh, I, I've been impressed by, by, his word, uh, by his words. In a sense, modernity started with the assertion of Francis Bacon, knowledge is power. Now, uh, we are discovering that... Uh, at the end of the, of the modern age, knowledge is impotence. Knowledge is multiplying our impotence in different ways. On one side, what we know actually is our impotence. On the other side, the multiplication of devices for um, recording um, and memorization and uh, knowledge is uh, a, a continuously um, uh, enforcing these uh, impotence. Um, can I come to, to the question of um, uh, of space. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember an article by Bill McKibben, uh, an important ecologist, one of the creators of the very expression greenhouse effect, Some a guy who knows, uh, not a stupid guy, I mean, and he, in an article titled Life in a Shrinking Planet, he describes in a very um, precise way what shrinking means, um, the, the, the effect of the ecological uh, uh, transformation of the global warming of the rise of the oceans is the shrinking of the habitable uh, spaces in the world. This is already happening. This is the main cause of the, the waves of migration that come from the south of the world toward the United States of America, or towards um, Europe, um, and so on. So uh, you see, we are entering probably in the final phase of the self, of the self uh, um, obliteration of the of the human of the humankind. I want to 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 bring one more example of it. Uh, probably uh, uh, probably an example that will become more and more clear uh, in the next uh, few months during the next uh, winter. The so-called great supply chain disruption. The effect that chaos is provoking into the very cycle of distribution of goods and production. Because when we don't have chips from a certain region of China because the, of the pandemic or because of the geopolitical um, crisis and so on, when we don't receive those chips, we cannot produce cars, we cannot produce computers. So the entire cycle of production is jeopardized by this effect of post-pandemic chaos. Um, I think that this is not a provisional effect. Uh, we know that the more a system is complex, the more uh, disruption are irreversible, are uh, proliferating, are creating uh, new effects. So, uh, well, that, that is, uh, we are probably walking towards uh, a world of knowledge without nowhere. In this sense, the idea of uh, Zuckerberg is uh, vicious, but genial, as usual. 
Meta is a philosophical jump into the obliteration of the humankind. The humankind is disappearing. What is left is a suffering body unable to, to, to think. All of knowledge is displacing from the real universe to the meta universe of the virtual reality fully accomplished. The name of this is death. Thank you. Thank you, Franco, for, for a very cheerful and optimistic uh, contribution, uh, uh, which is not a surprise to me, of course. Uh, and uh, thank you for also talking about the shrinkable space, you know, how space itself is shrinking uh, due to climate crisis uh, and how it will, you know, have radical transformations, uh, whether it is because of hundreds of millions of refugees coming from Bangladesh or, or the so-called South, Global South, or the militarization, what is already happening with Frontex. We have it, we see it on the border between Croatia and Bosnia and Herzegovina every day, but also in other parts of Europe. Uh, so obviously we are going towards uh, not just death, but also uh, uh, death on a massive scale. Uh, uh, but to, 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 to turn a bit the round and, and come to, 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 to try to envisage some sort of more positive, concrete uh, uh, examples, which might at least be kind of a you know a, a rescue package for for the situation in which we are today. Uh, I would love to turn to Renata, uh, who has been dealing with these topics, uh, uh, but starting from a negative. You know, uh, recently I read an article in the Forbes, uh, which said infrastructure of care is not infrastructure. Uh, where the journalist tries to, you know, prove that infrastructure is roads, uh, uh, buildings, uh, uh, you know, railways, and so on. But to speak about care, whether it is kindergartens, social housing, or whatever, it's not considered as infrastructure. So my question for you is, uh, do you agree with that? And uh, what kind of uh, infrastructure do we actually have to build? And what kind of uh, uh, fields of human activity or care do we have to take into account to build a kind of infrastructure to oppose this kind of bleak picture which both Boris and, and Franco have uh, painted for us. So would you consider care and what would it then entail also as infra infrastructure? Of course, uh, uh, care is infrastructure, and I will I will like take a risk here of also discussing some infrastructures of the future. But uh, to going going back to this care as infrastructure, you know, like the the interesting thing of the pandemic, and it's something that might be like uh, many left uh, liberals might dislike, is the going back to the family and to the extended concept of family, a family as an, as an infrastructure of care. And it not only this, I mean, it's something that I have seen in my culture and in indigenous cultures, you know, when, when the, the uh, migration among Mayan families in the US resisting the pandemic in a situation of irregularity of the migration status, the only way that they survived the pandemic was with the, this very tight solidarity networks connected with the town, connect, but again, connected with the local because what with the local. And I think that it is, it gives you also the idea of, uh, of belonging, even if you don't belong at all, and how uh, the, these diasporas do not connect in, 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 uh, in geographical areas, even when, when they migrate, they don't distribute. But the other thing that I wanted to um, highlight on in terms of infrastructure is data as an infrastructure. Data as an infrastructure that should be public, and it has been like stolen away from us. Because if uh, uh, when we think data as a public infrastructure, as an infrastructure that will enable us to build something new and better, and an infrastructure that has been like you know like um, extracted from us, uh, and and you know uh, we are we are not uh, in, enabled with the power that it brings, it it it, it is just the number one priority on the infrastructures of the future that we need to recover uh, to, to to take back. Why? Because uh, imagine if all these things as artificial intelligence, which is useful for many things, you know, machine learning and artificial intelligence are useful for many, bring many possibilities to deal with the complex problems that we are facing today. 
but they do not belong to us. You know, like a university has, has to pay a lot of money to access very small data sets. And they got very few companies had this superpower. So um, I think that the, when we think about redefining the rules of a city, redefining the rules of a neighborhood, taking back the data is fundamental. And the other thing is uh, uh, something that a positive example that I wanted to mention is centralization versus decentralization and, and the spontaneity of the uh, social economy uh, instead of uh, 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 and the peer-to-peer -peer economy. Something that happened from China to Barcelona, you know, peer-to-peer -peer networks were fundamental to, uh, to and, and, and back, are activated and fundamental to uh, tackle this crisis. Um, social support networks were the ones setting up, you know, uh, ways to provide masks, to provide ventilators, making things, going back to going back to bringing in common the skills and the abilities and the knowledge you have to, to, to help others. I think that, the, that the, the pandemic brought that back from even, you know, stru spontaneous structures of solidarity in buildings in China to uh, makers providing equipment to, to uh, with 3D printers providing equipment to Europe, you know, like in Europe, in the, in the heart of Europe. So I, I, I would say that um, it is uh, that self-organizing peer-to-peer infrastructure enabled by technology even, you know, is something that gives me hope. Uh, this taking back uh, the power of, of uh, self-organizing uh, and staying connected is, is just the, the, this basic infrastructure of connection that sadly we are like probably like uh, doing in, in the, with the wrong tools because it is always mediated by, you know, the metaverse and these crazy things. But you, you're just, uh, just connecting with the, the person next door and connecting um, across society, uh, not only to talk and complain, but to act. Is, is very relevant. And the other thing that I, I wanted to bring at the table is uh, space is shrinking, but also knowledge is shrinking with the digital transition. And something that um, it's, we see the biodiversity decay going on and we can measure it. But the shrinking of knowledge, we cannot measure. Knowledge allocated in each person and knowledge as, as a commons is disappearing as we speak. And the false idea of this digital transition that, oh, you will have access to all knowledge at any time and not cost is the biggest lie of our time. And it's something that uh, is related to space because in the past we had libraries, you know, we have in infrastructure of knowledge and that infrastructure has been cut off with the false idea that this immat immateriality could be enough to to preserve and to curate and to and to house our knowledge, uh, so that is also related to spaces and uh, and spaces that are disappearing and that make me like really uh, is, is 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 this not the knowledge is imp importance but knowledge in the infrastructure of knowledge is vanishing without anybody taking responsibility for it. Yeah, we could certainly now go into, into many directions and I hope until the end of the conversation we will tackle many of the questions all of you opened. Uh, but at this moment I find it very useful, uh, 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 this framework which Renata painted, you know, on the one hand centralized infrastructure and on the other hand decentralized infrastructure. So on the one hand you have decentralized infrastructure in the sense of uh, self-organized mutual aid. Uh, for instance, helping your neighbors during the pandemic, uh, or even more radical examples such as uh, semi or autonomous zones uh, of even political autonomous zones, whether we speak about the Zapatistas in Mexico or Rojava, or the project of autonomy on, on which uh, Franco was working on uh, uh, and has been participating in. But on the other hand, there is also more centralized infrastructure. Obviously, if we are going to face, and we are already facing catastrophes which are unprecedented, we need a centralized system which can approach these catastrophes. You know, just remember an earthquake, for instance, you need a centralized system 
Of course, although you always have decentralized solidarity and so on, but it's much easier with a centralized system in a case of a natural catastrophe and so on. Uh, so I want to, 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 to point the conversation towards Boris first and then back to Franco speaking more autonomy. Why Boris? Uh, because you, Boris, have written on the infrastructure of care, uh, uh, to put it like that, which was built during the uh, real existing socialism in former Yugoslavia. Uh, uh, you have been participating in, in the important exhibition at the Museum of Modern Arts in New York, uh, where the legacy of modernist architecture, uh, which is then connected also to social housing or to hospitals for children who were suffering asthma, just remember that uh, a major building in Krvavice on the Dalmatian coast, which is now abandoned. Uh, so if you look at the socialist architecture of ex-Yugoslavia, uh, you will actually come to an infrastructure of care which existed before this term nowadays became so popular again. Could you maybe speak more about it? What, what exactly did, did it consist of uh, besides social housing, hospitals? Why did we, I'm saying we, we who come would, from yeah. former Yugoslavia, abandon <laughs> yeah, yeah. this legacy? And what can this yeah. legacy tell us for the future? You know, how, what are you the know, lessons? Uh, you know, uh, those uh, who have destroyed this infrastructure in the name of democracy, of the West, of the freedoms, liberties, they would... They, they put their uh, uh, hopes and expectations into the notion of individual, you know, I individual who was in their uh, uh, fantasies opposed to the socialist totalitarianism, communism, etc. This is deeply wrong. Uh, and let me explain it. And, and Renata talked about the individualization. Originally, individualization is a part of civilizational process of liberation from, from, from the, you know, old uh, relations of dependency, pre-capitalist on family, neighborhoods, etc. At the same time, the individualization makes people more dependent on social infrastructure. Individuals uh, or welfare infrastructure, individuals, they need kindergarten, they need, they need care then, uh, for when they get old. So this is a very, very paradoxical uh, uh, situation in which I might say that it was precisely socialism offering such a, 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 a strong uh, welfare infrastructure was the real, the, the real fundament for some sort of, of individuals to develop. While today, this individualization is, is turning into, you know, look how in Paris, these tens of thousands of people, when they march against vaccination and they have the flags and banners, and what is the word on this? That liberty not solidarity. So they, they understand that it is, it is more individual, individual, uh, 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 you know, power and, and rights that will save them. But they are in fact following the old idea of Mussolini, you know, who once said that individualism is the very, the very essence of humanity. So fascism and individualism without social structure, this is you know, this is what is, 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 is threatening us. This is one point. And if you allow me, I would also say something to, the, to what, uh, what Renata and Franco about knowledge, about shrinking the, the spaces of knowledge. Let me give you the example of, of uh, you know, you, you mentioned uh, extinction, extinction of languages uh, uh, in, in, in the digital age. Recently, there was the study, Europe's languages in the digital age, and the experts analyzed 30 European languages, how they cope with, uh, you know, what is their, the digital support of them. And their conclusion was, after it's two years, two years research, and their conclusion is the digital support for 21 of 30 languages investigated, I quote, is non-existent or weak at best. And when it comes to future, the picture is even more grim. The D, they, uh, uh, they foresee that the most European languages are, I quote, unlikely to survive in the digital age. These are our small languages, <laughs> you know, these languages are no longer medium of any sort of 
knowledge. What we are witnessing now is a process of rapid, unstoppable revernacularization, or I would say neo-vernacularization of spaces, not only linguistic spaces, but you know, the whole states now, you know, it was, uh, are, are becoming a vernacular spaces. They are beyond beyond uh, major processes. I don't have to say that, that Google is stronger, that uh, big companies are stronger than, than, than uh, more, uh, the, uh, many of, of, of nation states, but we have the, the, the major process of, of, of uh, as uh, Renata said, shrinking of knowledge, but disappearing of, of, of uh, extinction of, of languages and knowledges and legacies. So socialism, nobody would, would be able, there, will, there, there will, would not be a language to remember this infrastructure. I know it, it, it sounds very grim, but, but uh, at the same time, I believe that these neo-vernacular spaces in which uh, the liberal elites see, you know, the, the space of populism, uh, etc., that this is a potential of new type of knowledge, knowledge which is, I call it, you know, um, plebeian cognitive potential, which has been completely erased in the academization of critical critical thinking you know in the in the in, in uh, 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 moving the whole knowledge to 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 few stronger or even one strong language you know and and uh, i i think that there is a potential to reactivate but of course, the plebeian potentiality, not the fantasies of the middle class, because this, as Hillary Clinton would say, hardworking, hardworking middle class uh, is, is broken. And, you know, one side is, 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 is uh, uh, complaining about the destruction of knowledge, how uh, primitive uh, uh, populist masses, uh, you know, don't understand and don't accept science, scientific, etc. Dreaming, you know, nostalgically about revival of, of the enlightenment on the one side. On the other side, uh, they're, they're like, like the, the, the uh, 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 you know, re-emergence of the suppressed, which always takes a different forms. Their liberal ideology comes in the fascist guys from these from this masses. So I, I think there is a potential, but not on, on, on this line of, of the existing knowledge production, uh, but precisely in this new, uh, as I call it, neo-vernacular spaces. Yeah, I think it's an excellent point to, to, to lead the discussion to back to Franco, because I would really love us to focus now more on this, what you, Boris, call uh, the possibilities, the potentialities of uh, neo-vernacular spaces. You know, perhaps the Mediterranean uh, uh, is, uh, or other spaces is a very good example how these vernacular spaces created a common culture of, uh, which lasted for millennials. You know, just read Brodel or Predrag Matvejevic and how these spaces can be spaces of creation uh, and also providing solidarity or a kind of uh, a transposition of knowledge through centuries. Uh, so my question for you, Franco, is could you relate to what just Boris said? On the one hand, the extinction of language, which are now becoming one language in the digital space, uh, which of course is not language, but is actually mathematics. And on the other hand, uh, uh, the possibility of creation of autonomous spaces. And how would this kind of autonomous spaces, uh, neo-vernacular spaces function uh, if we know that there is no escape from technology if we know that we are not technophobes, that we are not against technology, but want to use it as something uh, uh, for a good cause, as something which is common, which belongs to everyone, which can provide a better infrastructure of care and so on. So the relationship between this extinction, which Boris just mentioned, and the possibility of creating new spaces, or even what Foucault would have called heterotopias, like real existing spaces in the current dystopia. Uh, I, I'm afraid, Franco, we cannot hear you. You are muted. You have to un... Yeah, this is... Again, you have to unmute again. Wait a second. It's still red. Click it again. This is the uh, big brother sure. of technology. No. Yes. Okay. Now I'm here. I like 
this idea of um, autonomous zones uh, and uh, protecting and uh, um, transferring, translating and uh, saving something. It has been, in a sense, uh, the main practice uh, of uh, movements during the last 30 years, more or less. But I think that we must face uh, a, a, the reality of a jump uh, in in uh, in direction of the of the destruction of the very conditions of uh, uh, life uh, of survival as we have known it. So I think that uh, while reproposing the idea of temporary autonomous zones, uh, um, we should also elaborate a new strategy at the level of, uh, uh, um, of the world, of the entire uh, planetary catastrophe of uh, our times. And I had a sort of illumination a few days ago reading the Washington Post. I read a title speaking of four million and a half of American workers who decided not to go back to work. After the pandemic, they lost their work, their job, or they decided to quit their job. Anyway, they don't care about going back to work. I would say that this is the, the most uh, uh, widespread strike in the history of the worker class. But the interesting is the title of the article concerning this, uh, this um, event. The title of the Washington Post was the great resignation goes global. Resignation. I read this word and I started uh, thinking at full speed because the word resignation has two main meanings. Two, uh, uh, it's a, a double signifier. On one side means dismissal from work. On the other side, it means also acceptation. Wow. As a Marxist, in a first, in a, at first, I, I was shocked by discovering that the solution is resignation. Then I thought of the third possible meaning of this word. Resignation means also re signification of the world. So, keep your job, go away, abandon, huh? say can accept the evident reality. There is no way out. Third, change the meaning of your daily actions, work, consumption, sex, affection, uh, and so on. You see, resignation, uh, also the Christian meaning of this word came to my mind. For the Christians, resignation is a virtue because it is accepting the will of God. But as I am not Christian, I must say that the point is not accepting the will of God, and it is not accepting the will of the, the global corporations that have taken the place of God in the present reality. No, it's not. The resignation does not mean 
accepting evil means going away, leaving the place of uh, evil. Of course, I know that from a political, materialistic point of view, it is difficult to give uh, a, a practical meaning to this going away. Away, yes, but where? That is, uh, that is uh, the, the, the game that we are starting now, in my opinion. How can we go away, desert the space of war, the space of procreation? Procreation, in my opinion, is uh, the main commonplace that we have to come out from. Uh, the place of uh, consumption. All these, uh, all these places, how can be abandoned? And what places can replace the place uh, that have been destroyed? Uh, and poisoned by the legacy of capitalism. Yeah. Renata, I think uh, uh, I would love to hear your thoughts on, on it, uh, uh, what Franco just said, uh, in the sense of, okay, if we abandon the current uh, uh, legacy of capitalism or late capitalism, which is now taking over the infrastructure, the cities, uh, privatizing uh, uh, public spaces, but also making private spaces like this one's public or owned. And we, we are going into this kind of consumerism. Uh, how do you see technology itself uh, uh, providing us uh, a, a sort of mean to abandon this space, whether it's possible or not to abandon this space? That's another question. Uh, but is there still some emancipatory potential in current technological developments uh, which can help us build new spaces? Uh, for instance, we could speak about crypto here or NFTs. Do you see any kind of potential here that that might actually lead to a construction of better places? Or what kind of technology is it today in the very concrete materiality uh, which is building this kind of infrastructure of the future about which Franco talks about? And, uh, you know, something very interesting is happening now in the technology world because at the same time it's replacing, it's becoming a place for many people to go in a quasi-religious way. If you see uh, it, like the merge of uh, uh, capitalism and the absence of any ideology, you see uh, when a new MacBook is being released, uh, you see in the big cities all these people like sleeping outside the shops to get hold of this object and this adoration that they have, like the new leaders are the tech, the, the tech leaders, right? The thought leaders and then many followers of that take their words by the book, thinking that they can become such. But that's not what I'm going to. Uh, I want to refer. I, I would say that there's a deep reflection inside the inside the tech community, which is very interesting. It's called uh, the reflection around Web three. That is not uh, the same as Web, web 3.0. And that reflection is basically the tech community identified when we got it wrong and when the blank check was signed to the tech giants and which were the elements that enabled them to kick us out of the innovation stream and the imagination of new words and take, take it off. So the reflection now is... Very interesting because you know, like uh, technology is an innovation solution, go forward and forward and forward, never going back. But now there's uh, there's an emergent emergent trend of going three steps back and fixing what we ruined. And I think that that's very very interesting. You know, fixing both the data extractivism, fixing the centralized technology and going back to a, to a web space that is generative and that is not mediated by mobile phones and is not mediate is not completely controlled by um, the tech giants. I think that is, is possible. I, I, it's beyond this talk to explain the technicalities, but there's, there's a critical thinking now happening there uh, and it's not necessarily happening in the crypto, NFT, that's part of the bad, badly shaped 
things, but it's happening when we lost, where and when we lost uh, the internet for social purposes and how to get back there. And is, there's uh, thinking on, on its way. At the same time, we need to be alert of something. And I think for the audience of this talk is, is, is very interesting that technology used to live in the screens and in our devices. And very soon, if not already in many cities, is, it lives around us, interacting with us. It's like, a, like, like a, the beauty and the beast and all this, uh, you know, like moving things around the house. That's a new configuration, you know, that's a new configuration and a new, um, it's a new place within a new place. We need to lead, uh, learn to live with the integration of technology in an environment and, and, and the quantification of everything we do in any space and the impossibility to take a walk in a park without being watched. But at the, at the same time, I, I think that... Um, there's a false and dangerous thing going on as well. Uh, that, that We need to burst the bubble where technology placed our minds. And, and that's the, we, we talk, it took a, take about places. How this, all these interactions and heavy identification place an individual in imaginary words that are shaped by consumption is the challenge of the future. We have to burst that bubble and reconnect to actual reality. And, and, and that would, of course, not happen uh, mediated with the technologies of today. That might be assisted with the technologies of tomorrow, but that's something that uh, is going, is, is, is go I, I think, I, I, think I, I got into a like, dark spot now uh, on how to, because I, I, I have no, no solution for this. And I don't know if the solution is, I don't think that the solution is go to go to live a, in the, into a remote place, technically speaking. Uh, because what happens now is everybody leaves the city and goes to live in the remote place, but go, you, you are like living in an island, for example, and you are connected to the same polluted, uh, polluted and limited digital world that anybody else in the city. So even if you go away, you take all these really polluted digital place with you everywhere. So how do we break that and find also a way to escape this and reconnecting in, in better terms with, uh, with uh, the possibilities of digital. That's, that's the question of place that I, I'm asking myself and I have, still have no answer, but we are exploring solutions. That's all I can say. Definitely. I think what, uh, uh, what you now just opened is the start of the last part of our conversation. Uh, so on the one hand, uh, obviously there is this myth that you know, uh, which we have seen actually at the very beginning of the of the COVID crisis, uh, which is connected to inequality. You know that by escape from the city, you can come to the parts of the world where you will be in a house, beautiful nature, the great air, and so on. But if the accident of Chernobyl, for instance, has taught us anything, is that uh, cat real catastrophes, planetary catastrophes, know no borders radioactivity doesn't care about borders it will come to your city next day i know it very well because i was a child when i was living in munich in München, uh, uh in the 80s and i remember how we the children couldn't go to to public parks and even later they can now find levels of radioactivity in bavaria uh, so definitely there is no escape but for the last part of this conversation i would love us to come back to the very beginning of our conversation which is uh, it could be thought of as science fiction, but it's not anymore, uh, uh, which is another trend uh, which is now appearing, speaking about speciality, but also time, uh, which is space exploration. Uh, so we have already tackled, uh, uh, you know, big tech, Silicon Valley. Uh, uh, I'm also grateful to you, Renata, to, to showing how this, uh, uh, this new sort of Silicon Valley capitalism becomes a new religion. You know, Walter Benjamin could write a lot about it. And definitely besides the new Mac and the consumerism, I think space exploration, and then of course, singularity and artificial intelligence, but space exploration becomes this kind of new source of religion where the new Messiah, where the new Messiah will go. Uh, and you've probably seen these pictures uh, 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 with uh, Captain Kirk, William Shatner coming back from space, and then Jeff Bezos 
uh, uh, using it for the publicity. Uh, but there are also deeper points in which sense uh, state money, tax money is being used actually for private venture capitalism for those who will be presented as the savers of our planet. Uh, so I'll start uh, uh, in the same order as we started our conversation with Boris Renata, and then I will leave uh, Franco to conclude uh, your final thoughts on space exploration. In which way is is this new? Is this a new paradigm of uh, uh, new religion? Uh, uh, and in which way can can that perhaps be subverted, or can it be subverted, or are we destined uh, to have you know this little blue origin space stations instead of international space station and the rich going to space, leaving an abandoned, unhab uninhabitable Earth. I would, I would uh, uh, answer, rem reminding you and myself also of of certain materialist motivation or legacy uh, of my uh, education. And uh, speaking of space, I, I would like to, to to remind you on on uh, a notion of annihilation of space used by David Harvey, and it's which is very concrete, uh, very economic uh, uh, um, origin has an economic origin. This is the, the the process of the offshoring of production with the neoliberal uh, globalization, in which. Uh, with the, with the with the goal to reduce uh, the the wage costs and to reduce the wage share on uh, in, in in GDP, this is what he calls annihilation of space, and uh, this is why we might say we might say that that the place this was the clear message. The place does not matter. There is no such thing as an authentic original space, space to escape to. Uh, coming back to, uh, to, to you, what you mentioned, Mediterranean, you know, and Brodel. Actually, we know uh, if we historically analyze, it was the CIA who invested so much money in the new forms of historical research and supported very concretely Brodel so as to pose to oppose uh, Marxist concept concept of, of of history. So we see it is uh, you know there is space is 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 a, not an innocent there is not an innocent uh, 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 meaning of of space uh, what i simply very very concretely want to uh, uh, to point at is a, a process of 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 uh, uh, space transformation in terms of changing the 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 the, the meaning the function of the nation state you know it has been uh, for quite a long time said that uh, that in, in the globalized capitalist world a nation state is too big to solve small problems and too small to to solve big problems but uh, it it goes you know uh, much much further i i uh, i mentioned also this this process in which actually the not a, a welfare state but competitive state is you know, he invented the process of the subsidiarization and, uh, so, sorry, uh, a subsidiarization, which is uh, simply offloading its obligations and its, its, its uh, 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 duties to the to uh, this old, you know, communities, families, uh, neighborhoods, etc. So in this, I'm, I'm talking about a new space in which uh, I said already, the whole states uh, uh, are in the process of uh, revernacularization. Uh, revernacularization. The whole states become sort of large neighborhoods while large, while small neighborhoods, you know, have to play the role of, of, of small states. So these are new spaces, undefined spaces. I still believe, I still believe that 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 the decision will be will be uh, a political and within this within these uh, uh, spaces. Thanks a lot, Boris. Uh, Sorry, uh, we will go to Renata for her concluding remarks on this topic. Very very yeah. Sorry. Yeah, I will be very short. I, I don't have a lot to say about it, uh, so I will say just one thing. 
the interesting the interesting thing is uh, there's many like you know questions what, which rules will apply to them is is uh, is uncharted territory can they do whatever they want there in space and one of the things that is very interesting that I was looking at them we have a global pact and that's the universal universal declaration of human rights and so it would be very interesting how the visionaries that established the United Nations system went one step one step ahead of thinking on all the language and the, all the international instruments is, is drafted and crafted in a way of to apply to humankind wherever they are. So that's uh, deep, you know, because it was almost, you know, 70 years ago that they were drafting these documents. But uh, it, 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 it is the, they, they had the ability, leaders at that time had the ability to think beyond and above and to think that the, the, the values are carried wherever the place is by humans. And, and uh, when they talk multiplanetary, when they are, uh, are asking of colonization and all of this crap the, that sounds like, you know, like the, the, that was the, the Spanish crown, we need to remember of universal values and the global pact that we have. Um, that's all I have to say. Just noting that it's a lot of, you know, male dominated and all these ships, it's very phallic, all of it as well. Like it makes me think that they feel threatening the masculinity somehow. Anyway, but that's off topic. I think this is a great schlagwort for, for Franco Berardo Bifo, Bifo, whose new book is called The Third Unconscious. Uh, so speaking about the Bezos uh, rocket to space, we could also speak about the third unconscious. What is this unconscious, Franco? Where, where does this uh, uh, drive to colonize space come from and how does it look like to you? Uh, you have to unmute yourself. Yeah, I for, always forget. Uh, well, <clears throat> the modern unconscious uh, has been uh, changing in, in time. Unconscious has no time, but uh, the surrounding uh, uh, reality is changing the the, the relation be between unconscious dimension and rationality. So in the Freudian age, uh, unconscious was marked by repression, by denial, and, uh, and by neurosis. Then came the neoliberal unconscious, uh, which was uh, aiming uh, to boundlessness, to uh, the infinity of energy. The Freudian unconscious and the neoliberal unconscious are based on the masculine identification of uh, expansion of potency as the essence of the human. But this identification was baseless, was fake. <clears throat> Human is not equal to potency. Human is to be uh, emancipated by the obsession of uh, political potency, of sexual potency, of military potency. But now we are facing this phenomenon that you referred to of a small, very small part of the humankind that is clearly, openly planning the abandonment of the planet. When Jeff Bezos uh, uh, came back uh, from his uh, uh, short trip to the outer space, he said, I thank the workers and the customers of Amazon who have made possible my trip. He was saying the, the, the global capitalist class is thanking 
seven billions of human beings because with their work, with their suffering, uh, with their misery, with their despair, they are paying the outside uh, uh, trip of a small minority of, uh, of the humankind. Actually, I wonder why this inequality is growing and growing. Why uh, uh, during the last two years inequality has grown uh, uh, of the 30% uh, and the, the, the hyper-capitalist class has accumulated enormous fortunes. Why so much money? What is that for? Well, uh, uh, abandoning the planet is expensive. Abandoning the planet, creating an outer space is so expensive that it needs, it requires the sacrifice of the enormous majority of the humankind. This is the simple truth. They will, they, will they succeed? Will Bezos and Musk and so on will succeed in this project of um, colonization of the outer space. Of course, I do not know. I think they will not. Because under this project, there is a, a superstition, the superstition of the infinite potency of the human will. And this presupposition is wrong. Thanks. Uh, I think we couldn't find better concluding words uh, uh, that this belief of, of the indefinite human potency is a complete myth and that we have to start from actually looking at our uh, lack, which would also be a, which would bring us in a more psychoanalytical uh, direction of the conversation. But unfortunately, we are at the end of our conversation. I want to thank uh, uh, all our speakers, Boris, Renata and Franco. Uh, I would also love to thank the audience and Oris and the Censure for the Future of Places for enabling this platform uh, to speak about these important topics. If you want to find out more about these topics, follow the work of Buden Avila and P4, you can find it in the semiosphere on the internet while it's still there. So thanks a lot and ciao to everyone.